Over the last 10,000 years, we've domesticated dozens of animal species and a broad range of plants, expanding the human domain to vast swathes of the world. Control and dominance over the rest of nature has been of cultural significance for almost the entirety of mankind's history. Whether it's uh, cave paintings depicting animals to be hunted, or agricultural pro uh, processes shown in Egyptian artworks. This has been core to our, uh, our ideals for a very long time. This long-term trend is epitomized by the formal gardens of Versailles. There, we aim to show how man could tame and control nature, taking it from its seemingly messy state into clean lines and geometric forms. These displays, though, have led us to feel like we've won a kind of war with nature. And in a sense, we have. We no longer fear attacks on our people or property, and our food supply is remarkably stable. Increasingly, though, today, this feels like a hollow victory. Biodiversity loss is affecting a huge number of other species. And our ability to act freely in our own short-term self-interest is undermining these species at large. As a result, we find, found ourselves scrambling to try to prevent this loss and to protect the species that we have. It's unclear, however, for what reason we've chosen to support this specific balance of nature. Preservation inherently tries to uh, maintain an ideal state rather than allowing change that nature is so good at. Whether you pick 100, 1,000, or 10,000 years ago, these are all arbitrary points in life's long history. In doing what we're doing now, we're trying to prevent what nature is so good at, adaptation. The scientific dogma is as such that we should never interfere with nature, that we should let it take its course and learn from it, only passively observing it to find new ways of understanding it. But we interfere with nature every time we ship a new container, emit a new pollutant, or fell a tree. We need to learn how to have a positive impact on our environment, not merely mitigate what we do now. Otherwise, all we can hope for is to slowly reduce the way that we are impacting our environment and have a slow descent into disaster. Change is not the problem here, but biodiversity loss instead. Biodiversity loss not only affects the species in question, but life on Earth as a whole. The extinction rate is currently a thousand times higher than the baseline pre-man level. That means dozens of species going extinct every day. The number of insects on Earth has reduced by 35% since the 1970s. And this is as high as 75% in some places. If nature was left to its own devices, it could recover biodiversity in five to seven million years. But this is longer than mankind has even existed and, and assumes that we're gonna curb our impact in the next 50 years. With these facts in mind, it becomes clear that mitigation of our impact and reduction of this impact is not a viable strategy to solve this problem. Instead, we should work to have a positive impact. In order to learn how to have a positive impact, we must act. We cannot uh, learn through passive observation alone. In order to figure out how to have this positive impact, we developed augmented nature. Augmented nature is a set of tools to help animals adapt better to human-induced changes in their environment. It's also a talking point for active intervention in nature for us to start to understand what it means to intervene with animal lives. We're a team of designers and engineers, and working on the basis of the human-centered design movement, we're looking to expand our understanding and our design skills from that of understanding humans, but to design for nature too, animals and whole biological systems. In order to understand our client better, we talk to biologists and ecologists from across the world. By doing this, we, we learn about ecosystem engineers. They're an amazing group of species that by manipulating their own environment, they build habitats for other species all around them. A notable example of this is the beaver, creating dams for aquatic life, life alongside it, or the honeybee, pollinating plants all around it. Our story, though, starts with the humpback whale. The humpback whale is an is a, is a ecosystem engineer that does its work through a process called the whale pump. The whale pumps nutrients from where it's based in the deep in the ocean when it hunts up to the surface populations as it comes up to breathe. As it does this, it spews fecal matter, proving, giving it nutrients for valuable life all around it. 
in doing this, it provides a, a new source of life and a new habitat for, uh, that would not otherwise exist. Unfortunately, the whale is threatened. It's threatened by a lot of different man-made impacts. Many of them, though, are related to noise. Industrial activity in the ocean means that it is excruciatingly loud. We tend to think of the ocean as a peaceful place, quiet and serene. But in reality, there are a huge number of jackhammers, pile drivers, and propellers in the ocean attached to these large ships that prevail. This is particularly problematic for whales, as they primarily communicate through the use of sound and understand their environment in the same way. As a result, they've started to, uh, to change their behavior to adapt in order to make their calls louder and lower and to cut through the noise that's around them. Even despite this, though, the effect on their population is drastic. Their populations are falling rapidly through ship strikes, through noise-induced confusion. And it's not only a problem for the whales, it's a problem for the shipping companies, too. On some trade routes now, there are speed restrictions in place because it's so likely that a ship is to hit a whale in that location. And if we carry on down our current path of trying to mitigate our impact, trying to reduce the bad that we do, these restrictions will become closer and closer, constantly fighting economics against ethics of nature in a battle that often, lo uh, that often nature loses due to the nature of our current, uh, our current you know, uh, social order. So we propose a radical solution. We provide crucial information to the whale and to the shipping company to allow the whale to begin to move its habitat away from the ships and the ships to move away from it. To prototype what this could look like, we created a biotag. And this biotag, rather than only collecting data for humans, as is normally done with the tags attached to whales, it also allows the provision of providing data to the whale, valuable information for it. The tag has a GPS and a broad range of sensors, in addition to a microphone and underwater speaker on it that allow it to provide stimuli to the whale. By testing different stimuli and sounds, we could help the whale to start figuring out, navigating, communicating, and understanding these rapidly changing oceans. By augmenting its senses, the whale could better understand human activity in its environment in a way that evolution has not yet offered it. Next, we looked at the collared peccary. The collared peccary is another ecosystem engineer and one of the most mobile animals in the Amazon rainforest. The collared peccary distributes many seeds in its environment over a large territory, as well as digging wallows in the ground, essentially wet pools that are like plowing the soil for aquatic organisms and seeds too. The collared peccary, though, is also at risk, this time due to logging and agriculture in its environment. In order to look at how animals and humans could live alongside better, again in this case, we developed another biotag. This time its primary input was a camera, a camera with a pre-trained computer vision algorithm that can recognize a range of plants. By doing this, we can recognize fauna and flora in the forest around the, uh, the peccary and transmit this data to scientists working in the area along with rainforest communities that collect valuable, sustainable, non-timber resources. In doing this, we can also aid scientists in mapping the rainforest, something that is very difficult at the ground level for humans to do. Again, it's not only an input source, though. We also provide information to the, to the peccary. The tag has four vibration motors on it, which allow us to pr produce stimuli and build on work previously done by scientists looking at domestic pigs in farming situ situations that need valuable information about their surroundings. In this case, we provide information about where to distribute seeds for the most effect, how to avoid human dangers in their location, and also start to work on new hunting behaviors. If implemented correctly, these both, both of these uh, interventions could become symbiotic relationships between man and animal, looking at a new way of working to have a positive impact in our environment. They're not without their risks, however, and meddling with nature is dangerous. So we must begin small before building up to the scale that we require for a large-scale impact. And what would this look like? What would a symbiotic future look like? We could expand and weave new wildernesses made of human and non-human animals alike. With technologically aided adaptation, we could unlock new habitats for a broad range of species while also allowing humanity to sustainably expand by blending in with the biology that we ultimately are reliant upon. 
The future doesn't have to be desolate, and the future doesn't have to mean regression. But ultimately, we must design for our animal peers because it's the only way that we can flourish. Thank you.